Somebody emailed me asking what my sussy reading was on this guy called Cole Hastings. I've never seen this channel before, but it seems like a men's self-help advice channel. And I'm concerned with men's self-help advice. Okay, right off the bat, I'm getting bad vibes from this channel. I tried doubling my testosterone naturally in two weeks, which magically led to Photoshop changing my body from left to right. Okay. How to stop being the weird guy, the tragedy of self-improvement. You will always be miserable if you don't understand this. The rise of NPCs, why critical thinking is dead. Okay, so it's a, it's a conservative channel. Okay, gotcha. How to unfuck your life. Okay, here's the thing, by the way. I know that, like, I know that conservatives and Dunning-Kruger syndrome are, like, a one-to-one -one Venn diagram overlap. But why the fuck would somebody who's making, like, fitness workout social advice also feel themselves capable of making a video on critical thinking? Like, why would you... Th okay. What's Dunning-Kruger syndrome? Dunning-Kruger syndrome is when somebody disagrees with me. Uh, how to unfuck your life. You know what? Sure. This one has a million views. Big video. Let's go. Let's go. Let's see how much I agree with. He made a video called Masculinity Crisis. Well, I do think there's a masculinity crisis. I fully agree with that. It really just, you know, that's the first statement. You know, where do you go from there? Oh, Ahoy put out a new video. What's up? Your life is pretty trashed. At least I'm true. I'm assuming it is if you decided to click on this video. <laughs> True. Oh, interesting. Whoa, hold on a second. I think I have this exact sweater. It's in my color, burgundy. I think I have these exact patterns on the shoulder. I'm pretty sure. I think I have this exact sweater, but I packed it away yesterday to donate because I don't wear sweaters. Put it on. No, I put it, it's not even in a bin. I put it in a, gar in a bag. Uh, no, I'm not opening up the bag that I labeled and neatly organized. So you wore sweaters? I mean, I basically just buy anything that's burgundy. Perhaps things were going pretty well for you. You finally started taking care of yourself, made a couple friends, and your self-talk was starting to transition to positive. But then... Transition? Okay. Video's a bit loud. Turn that down. Okay. You had a laundry list of L's pile up that led you down a deep, deep rut. Or maybe your entire life up until this point has felt like a never-ending nihilistic doomsday with a self that doesn't care about anything and gives in to everything that makes you feel worse about you and your life. Either way, I'm sure I can relate at least a little bit, because not too long- This is already, like, so overproduced. Uh, I can- so this is meant to, like, appeal to younger people, I'm guessing? Usually I assume when- when- when I see a video that's really overproduced. I get the feeling like they're trying to hold the attention of people who normally wouldn't be able to for that long. Long ago, I also had very few friends, about $10 in my bank account, was getting terrible grades, had no job, no purpose, and I had very low self-worth. So I wanted to ask myself, if I had to start from absolute zero and had no friends, no money, I was out of shape, I locked myself in my room all day, and I hated myself, how would I un my life? Well, that's the question I wanted to answer, so I tried to simulate exactly everything I would do to get myself out of rock bottom. Okay. Alright, this isn't what I expected, but we're gonna go through it anyway. Okay, so the premise here is hypothetically, if you're a neat, how do you get out of that? Alright, let's find out. Let's Before do Before I would even try to move my life in a direction that would benefit me... I would get NordVPN. Sorry. What does neat mean? Uh, no education... Uh, employment or training. It's just like, it, it just means you're a fucking loser. Okay. I'd first want to make that direction my own. You see, most people are just aimlessly wandering throughout life, hoping that they will eventually find their calling if they just keep doing what they're doing. Or even worse, they don't realize that if they don't pick their purpose themselves, then someone else will pick it for them. This is the first step to establishing some sense of control over your life creating your own purpose. The night before I would start my journey towards leaving the ruts, I'd write down exactly what. Uh, right, right off the bat, I disagree. Um, the reason why people have trouble finding their purpose isn't because they're like NPCs who just like float through life. A lot of it is because the mundanities of life, especially like economically, really prevent people from finding the time or the initiative to get the stuff done that they want. Also, it's really difficult to find your purpose if you haven't been given the opportunity to test out stuff that you're interested in. This is one of the reasons why when kids are young, it's considered like good for parents to try to get them into like soccer and pottery and like try a bunch of things, you know, because you never know what you're actually going to like. But if you grew up poor, didn't have much of an opportunity to try out a bunch of stuff, 
um, did the best you could in school, and now you're barely scraping by enough to survive, you don't really have much time to find out what you even like to do, let alone money to pursue it. Um, I, I just, I don't like the idea that self-improvement is about, like, breaking the mold and being better than people around you. It's not a combative thing. In fact, in a good society, self-actualized people would help other self-actualized people and non-self-actualized people self-actualize. It wouldn't be about outperforming your peers. It would be about a shared network of communication and support that allows everyone to find what they enjoy doing and spend as much time doing it as possible. It's about um, cooperation, fundamentally. That's why social engagement is so important when it comes to, like, unfucking your life, right? Yeah, you don't want the rise and grind set bullshit because that stuff makes people miserable. Honestly, what the fuck is self-actualization? By self-actualization, what I mean is, like, you are aware of what you are and what you want, and you have the ability to pursue it. Like, you are, you aren't just, you, you aren't just doing things. You have, like, a, like, like he says, like, like a kind of purpose, you know? Um, you're, you're living life in a fulfilling and meaningful way. Um, because you're aware of what you are, what you can do, and you're doing your best within those frameworks. Yeah, Maslow's hierarchy is one way to think of it. Like, you meet your basic needs, and then you can pursue the more, like, uh, you know, extravagant stuff. Why I am seeking a different life, and who I am trying to become. When figuring out my why, I would take into account Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Oh, hey. This is an idea proposed by the psychologist Abraham Maslow that essentially states that there are tiers to human motivation represented in a pyramid like this. Now, within each tier- It should be noted, by the way, that uh, Maslow's hierarchy- Maslow? Maslow's hierarchy of needs is just, like, a useful way of thinking of things. It is not actually, like, a determined- objective way of framing human needs um that's that's not act like it's it's like it, it's people use it as kind of like a shorthand for some concepts it's like freud you know freud uh wrote on stuff that you can kind of casually refer to in in common parlance but you would like you wouldn't use freud to build out like a big thesis on modern psychiatry because a lot of his stuff has been debunked here, there are things which almost all humans need in order to feel fulfilled and safe in their life. And I would make sure that the why I wrote down contained one of those hierarchy of needs and was descriptive enough so I wasn't confused about where I was heading. Okay, so I just took some time to write down my why in my journal. Wrote down breathing. Got it. Got it. Max. Uh, got a sigma max. I wrote down breathe every day multiple times. Question mark. Question mark. Got, got that down. And I just want to explain what I wrote and why I wrote it. This is what I wish I would have started off as back then when I first started getting into actually improving myself and caring about what I do with my day. So first and foremost, I want to wake up every day feeling energized instead of tired AF. That's Secondly, good. I want to enjoy the body I'm in, not just because I know I'll be treated better, but because it'll be easier for me to feel good about myself. So that's hitting a few of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's hitting safety as well as love and belonging. Next, I want to have a fulfilling job. It, is it? How is it hitting love and belonging? If Okay, whatever, just, okay. I want to feel like I'm contributing to the world in a positive way that can also support me financially. Then I'd also like a close group of friends that I can enjoy downtime with and who will also help support me and lift me up. Lastly, I just want to be more present, enjoy my limited time here on Earth, and know that I loved the journey instead of the destination. Then I would start to write down my new identity. I, I, I wonder, like, I... Man, I feel like making a checklist where one of the checklists is enjoy my limited time on Earth might be framing the problem in a way that makes it kind of unaddressable. Normally, when you want to get out of a rut, you actually want to focus on small things that you can do and can achieve, and you want to work out from there, slowly building confidence as you try to, like, um, you, you, you try to, like, establish to yourself you're capable of meeting these goals. Writing down a checklist where you're like, okay, I want to get fit, I want to be healthy, I want to have a great friends, I want to be happy, I want to make money. It's like, okay, I mean, I think a lot of people want that, and that's good to want, but I don't know if writing... Oh, maybe. Maybe it's like a person-to-person -person thing. But it's good to understand what you can actually focus on. He'll probably get to that or the person I was trying to transform myself into. If you are unhappy with who you currently are and the types of things that people say about you to reinforce who you are, then just be yourself is pretty terrible advice. Of course, everybody has some sort of unique gifts or interests that make them who they are, but if you're in this stage of your life, you either haven't figured those out yet or you're not using them in a positive way. So I would start to mold the idea of the person who I could become, who I would be proud of in my head. I'd make sure to visualize what that person looked like, the things they would tell themselves, what type of life 
life they would have, and lastly, write down what I think it would take to get there so I could start a plan of action. All right, so I've written a whole bunch of bullet points for my new identity that I would like to create. I'm not going to try to go over all of them right now. I'll just show them on screen. Healthy Gamer GG has a good video about this concept. Basically, he says, look at days that went well and try to replicate the conditions that made that day go well rather than focusing directly on fixing a problem. Um, oh, that's actually a good idea. That's a good way of thinking about it. If you had a good day, like what made it good? Did you have a good day because you had like a chance to talk to a friend, you got some cleaning done and you had a nice meal? Okay, well, maybe that's something you should try to like strive for generally. You know, that's a good idea. Yeah. Oh, this this is a lot of stuff here. Okay. Um very briefly right here, but I think this gives me a good foundation with which I can build upon and transform myself into this new identity. The next part of stage one is the most crucial because it's when real change starts to take place. Once you've prepared yourself for the journey ahead, you need to ask yourself, what is the next smallest step I can take to start moving towards that identity? The I, reason we want to do this- I agree with that. Yeah, no, I think that's true is because we want this process to be as painless and actionable as possible. What stops a lot of people from moving in the direction that they wanna to move towards is when they start to think about the bigger picture and just how long that's gonna to take to get there. It is not in your favor to try and think about every part of your new identity at once and to try and adopt each new habit at once. Okay, I agree with that. Yeah, I agree. You'll only end up overwhelming yourself, and you should focus on no more than two gradual changes you want to see out of yourself at a time. All right, so here's the next small step. It's gonna start tomorrow morning. I'm gonna not use my phone for the first hour of the day, and I will do so by hiding my phone in another room. And that is literally it. I'm not gonna focus on anything else until I finish that smallest step. And once I am done with that smallest step, I'll move on to the next smallest step. So the last thing I'm gonna do tonight before I go to bed is I'm gonna rip out the why I want to change page that I filled out, as well as my new identity page i'm gonna put it on how can you even read that handwriting from that distance um i i do think okay man i don't want to sound like a like a boomer or whatever uh and i do all my work on the computer so you know to an extent like i kind of rely on net dependence but the, the like modern smartphones are killing us i don't mind computers as much because you can walk away from them but phones you take everywhere and the main issue I think a lot of people have when it comes to depressive tendencies is a, a, a lack of mindfulness. Like, when I'm at the computer, I'm sitting here. But when I get up to, like, go downstairs to do something or finish something, if I have my phone with me all the time, then all the stuff that I do kind of merges together into this amorphous blob of stuff happening while I'm doing the thing I was doing on my phone whether that be reading an ebook or a manga or checking Twitter or doing this or that, the other, and it all kind of bleeds together. I think generally speaking, things are a lot better, both like productivity wise and men like mental health wise, if you try to compartmentalize some of the stuff that you do so you can be a bit more mindful of what it is you're actually doing. I don't think there's anything wrong with listening to a podcast while getting chores done, for example. I think that's a good way of having a phone with you. Like, that seems like um, a helpful and productive accompaniment to anything else you might be doing. If you're like doing dishes or cleaning up, that seems okay. It's more like if you sweep a little bit and then you check your phone and kind of lean against a wall for three minutes while checking like Twitter, and then you're like, oh, right. And then you sweep a bit more and get the dustpan. And then at the dustpan space, you're like, oh, okay. And you check a thing and somebody wrote you back. So you message them. And then you like get that and you look over there. Blah, blah, blah. And then at the end of it, it took you 20 minutes to sweep two rooms. Um, and all you got for it was you replied to like one DM a bit faster and you're now like familiar with one or two tweet threads. And it's like, okay, you could have swept everything in three minutes and been fine. Um, how much stuff do you actually like, how much are you happy about like actually consuming after the fact? A good way I think of thinking about it is at the end of the day, how much of your time with your phone do you remember? Because I remember a lot of the stuff that I do on the computer, because the stuff that I do in the computer is either work focused or it's something that I'm like engaged in. If I'm playing a game, for example, I often remember at the end of the day, like, hey, that was a fun game. Like, yeah, you know, was, I really enjoyed playing Elden Ring or I really enjoyed playing uh, Metal Gear Revengeance. It's like, yeah, it's a good game. Um, but on my phone, I probably spend every day like four to six hours a day on my phone at minimum. I don't remember most of the time that I'm on my phone, though. A lot of it's just me blearily, like, on the phone. And I think that's bad for your mental health. It, 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 it negatively affects your mindfulness. It, 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 it reduces your ability to conscientiously engage with the stuff that you're actually doing at the moment. You don't want to live your life on autopilot. Does that make sense?
I love having such a powerful pelvic floor that I never need to clean my toilet because um, pissing in it is like using a, um, a power washer. It's like those oddly satisfying videos of people with the power washers, like uh, 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 scouring uh, scum off of stone pavement tiles uh, outside their house, you know? Really, really useful. Yeah, power washing it 24-7. Oh, honest to God, by the way, like jokes aside, uh, one really common trait for depressive people, I think, is that they'll need to pee, but they won't actually pee for a long time. And that's usually because their brain is like a fucking haze, and they'll be sitting at the computer thinking like, oh, yeah, I need to pee, my bladder's full, but they'll have like something else they have to do that one second, and then it's like this other thing and this other thing, blah, blah, blah. It sounds kind of weird from an outside perspective, like it sounds ridiculous, like just go pee, but it's really about like an overlapping series of priorities that are just kind of like, aimlessly bouncing around and something else always takes precedent. Yeah, this ADHD factors into this, but depressiveness can also um, contribute to executive dysfunction, which is what I'm talking about. Which is why my suggestion to all of you is that one of the best life skills you can learn is that if you want to do something, just do it. I know, forehead, but like, that's a powerful life skill. If you see a thing in the house that's messy, something that needs done, if you know that there's an email you have to reply to or this, that, the other, you can just, like, you will feel like a god if you can master that skill. And learning how to do it, there's a million ways to learn how to do it. And, you know, it, it's not easy, but if you can learn to do it, you will be so powerful. You will be unstoppable. You will be a god, okay? on my wall i'm just going to tape it on my wall so i'm constantly reminded of why i want to do this the direction that i'm trying to strive towards and the person i'm trying to be with that all out of the way we are starting the first day of getting out of this massive hypothetical rut all right good morning today is the first day of getting myself out of this very down bad rut i've been awake for about 30 minutes and i already started my day by not using my phone so i should be able to do that for the first hour like i wanted to and then we can start to focus on the next smallest step also what i'm going to be doing every single day is i'm going to be writing down three goals i want to do and now let me show you this every time i complete something no matter how small it is that is getting me towards the identity that i'm trying to become i'm going to write it as a w on this board so i already started off Oh my god, this absolutely is for kids. Oh my god. With a W because I didn't use my phone, so we're just gonna put that down right there. And I'm going to tally up a bunch of W's or L's throughout my day based on the actions that I do with my day, no matter how small they are, as long as they are pushing me towards the self that I'm trying to become, it counts as a W. So because- Okay, I'm just gonna say this. I don't think this is necessarily bad, but I think that sometimes there's actually a downside to a over gamification of self betterment. Oftentimes people who are depressive will not even be able to keep daily journals because they are too forgetful or too out of it, you know, to like to actually manage that. And I think it's important to develop on internal reward systems that don't necessarily require the constant upkeep of maintaining a journal because you, you, I, I think you'll find that even if your days are getting better, realizing you didn't log a couple of days in a row, in retrospect, can make it feel like the good things didn't happen. Like, oh, maybe that day was good, but like, I didn't, I didn't like write it down or I didn't like mark my progress. So it's like, it, it, it doesn't, it's not really part of like the gamified system that I'm using to track my betterment. And again, there's nothing wrong with the gamification. I just think it's important to identify whether that's something you can keep up. I, even when I'm not even remotely depressive, can't keep a journal for shit. I know for a fact that I'm not capable of maintaining any kind of long-term diligence. I always get my work done in bursts. I'll have days where I do nothing productive and just relax, and then I'll have days where I get an insane amount of work done, and I've always been like that my whole life, and I'll die that way. And that's fine, that's just how I am, but it makes keeping a journal impossible, because I would only ever write anything down during the days where I'm already doing really well, rendering it kind of pointless. Um, just understand what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of basket case you are before, um, you know. Because one of the goals on my board is 30 minutes of movement total, I'm going to go outside and get some movement right now. I'm just going to go for a simple walk and I am going to count that as a W because we're trying to pile up those W's. All right, walk done. You know what that means. It means we are adding another W. I, I wonder if it would be kind of negative to like be doing this stuff just for the W if you don't really have a full understanding of what exactly is making you happy or what's improving stuff. So it would be, it would be kind of like, you know, 
going on a walk is a great idea. Ideally, you should go on a walk every day, weather permitting, of course. But if it's like you do it and you're like forcing it out because you just want to like mark the little W, I wonder if that would end up making things a lot worse in retrospect. Because it's like, okay, well, the stuff, like it's not even making me happy, you know? Again, not necessarily bad, just to the board. Let's start stacking those up today. Now, at this point in the day, I would simulate me going into my part-time job as a busser, which I was doing when I was down bad. And when I got back, to continue on completing the first goal, I would do a very simple at-home workout. Pretend I don't have any muscles. If you are someone with zero previous gym experience, then doing a couple exercises at home is a great place to start, even if it doesn't seem like much. When that goal was complete and we tallied another W, I decided to tag- Exercise is always good. Uh, if you are physically capable of exercise, you should exercise. Your body is keyed to reward exercise with endorphins. You will sleep better if you exercise. Even 15 minutes of yoga or light stretching can be incredibly good. My personal recommendation for exercises that anyone can do with a lot of success is this. Hold on. You <laughs> Jerks off, yeah. You can get these exercise bands for like zero dollars basically anywhere in the world. And if you just look up a couple of basic exercises that you can do with exercise bands, it's actually insane how much you can get done. Like, it's it's actually ridiculous. It, it, like, there's so much that you can do just with these. There's every muscle in your body you can work it out. Uh, so I strongly recommend doing that, you know. Where are the stretch bands? They are everywhere. They're very easy to get. Super, super useful. Like, to, to be clear, okay? If you know what you're doing with stretch bands, you can use them to good effect with no experience exercising, or you can use them when you're already like a really strong guy who reps 225 in the bench. They're like so useful, you know? It's so good. They're so good. So just, yeah. Recommend those a lot. Is giving blowjobs an exercise? Uh, yeah, but I don't think it's going to give you endorphins for the same reason that the stretch bands will. So try to do both. Just try to do like 10 to 15 minutes of exercise a day. Do folk find, okay, get some stretch bands for again, like literally five bucks. Um, get some stretch bands, uh, look up some stretch band exercises. Okay. One of which focuses on your quads, one of which focuses on your chest and one of which focuses more on your back, um, or your, um, or your biceps. And, uh, uh just try to do like three reps of 10 for each of those three exercises. You can do that in 15 minutes really easily. Just do that. Um, it'll feel so good if you can make a habit of that. Tackled the next goal, starting to write a script for YouTube. And the reason I'm gonna be writing a YouTube script is, well, because if I was starting over, I would still wanna be doing YouTube because I love what I do. And the first thing to- Okay, be hold on. If you want to help with mental health issues, do not become a YouTuber. Hold on, this is actively bad advice. Don't do that. Becoming a YouTuber would be to make a YouTube video, so in order to do that, I need a script to record. Alright, let's just say I finished half of the hypothetical script. That means I did this, that means another W, but I'm also gonna put an L up on the board here because while I was writing the script, I used my phone a little bit too much and I wasn't totally focused on it. So I'm being realistic with myself and counting that as an L, even though it's really not a big deal. But still, we got four- I... don't... I, yeah, no, I, no, I, no, 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 I, I think this is actively bad. I don't think this, I don't think this pattern, th yeah, this is performative. Um, you're playing a little game with yourself here. I don't think this is actually about building better habits or patterns. The idea of somebody who's trying to better their life when they're already in a rut, like, self-policing to be performatively down on themselves or to accept that they failed in some way because they were on their phone for a bit is the kind of depreciatory behavior that keeps people in those ruts. In fact, radical positivity is the best way of getting out of basically any rut, because usually people who are in those ruts develop these like cycles of thought where they're like, oh, of course I didn't do that right because I'm a fucking failure because I fucked up, you know? Like, oh yeah, obviously that didn't work out because of this, that, the other. When in reality, failure and not meeting your own expectations are not only natural parts of life, but something that happens to everyone all the time. Uh, the only people who don't experience that feeling are people who are like, I don't know, megalomaniacal or people who have personality disorders. In reality, failing to meet your own expectations is a healthy part of life. But that doesn't mean you have to be negative about it. Uh, it's just like a thing to note, you know? Oh, I meant to clean the entire house today, but instead I cleaned like 80% of it. Okay. And then you just clean the other 20% later. 
Confidence and positivity are the keys to fixing any kind of long-term mental health issue. Well, I shouldn't say that. Not any mental health issues. But a lot of them. Most of them. Positivity is critical. Four W's, one L. It means that today overall has been a W so far. Now there's just one thing I would like to do because I think it will help me improve my conversation skills as a down bad person with pretty much no friends and not very good social skills. The last one here, if you can even read my terrible handwriting, is to say hi to a stranger, maybe ask them a few questions. Again, we're not focusing on perfection because perfection is the killer of dreams. That is true. That is true. And by the way, talking to strangers is an excellent way to, um, uh, is an excellent way to develop social skills. Um, if you're ever out at a grocery store, retail outlet, literally anything, uh, if you're getting a coffee from Starbucks, exchanging like two or three sentences with the barista or whatever else is very, very helpful for developing confidence and the ability to talk to people. So if you're ordering a coffee at Starbucks or something, all you have to do is go like, hey, how's your day going? And they'll be, almost always, they'll say, oh, it's going good. How about you? And then you can say, oh, it's, it's going good. Thank you. And then at the end of your interaction, you can say, have a nice day. And that's literally it. Uh, this is, I think, to some of you, probably quite harrowing, but it's still very possible. And it's something that you should work towards. Um, it, you know, it makes their day a bit nicer, too, because it, I mean, you know, it's, it's nice to be a little bit social. Um, but yeah, you're checking out at the grocery store, like the, the grocer is bagging your groceries, and you can be like, um, oh, yeah, how's the day? Weather's looking nice, da-da. Like I've said before, small talk may feel mundane to a lot of you, but small talk isn't about the actual talk. It's about the tone that you're reading in other people. If you're talking about the weather with a, a grocery bagger, you're not really talking about the weather. You're sharing your respective tones, which is why nobody would care about weather information from somebody who's coming across, like, grumbly. Like, if you're having small talk with somebody and they're coming across as really disinterested and gruff and stuff, you wouldn't continue the small talk about the weather. Because it's not actually about the weather. It's about sharing positivity. You guys understand? So a lot of people say they don't like small talk. And I think like this is kind of a bad way of thinking about it. You can choose the subject of the small talk, but it is normal to try to gauge tone and interest from other people. Uh, with lighter conversational topics. It's not like you're going to start talking about like Carl Jung's philosophical texts or whatever with a grocery bagger. You know, you need to, um, you, you, you need to just have a nice, simple, light thing to focus on. So I went to the grocery store to start swapping some ah. of my unhealthy foods for healthy ones, and I decided to use this opportunity to talk to the cashier who was wearing... Hey, the hey, 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 hey! Oh, by the way, um, oh God, there's so much to say on this subject. Eating healthy food is good, but don't, please, please do not go to the grocery store and think like, what would a healthy person eat? And then like, spend an hour and a half there, like depressively crawling through the store, walking by all your favorite foods as you go like, um, I guess Brussels sprouts are healthy. Because if you do that, you're going to throw away 90% of the food and you're going to be miserable and you're going to spend a lot of money, okay? The best things that you can do is you can try to find simple recipes that you think you could make pretty easily and pretty quickly that are reasonably healthy and try to make that pretty often. So a good example would be rice and beans. Everyone can make rice and beans. Rice and beans are full of nutrients. They're healthy. They're a good staple food. They can be used uh, in, in conjunction with basically anything. You can use them for, for a lot of stuff. Um, and you can meal prep with rice and beans incredibly easily. Everyone loves rice and beans. So maybe think like, okay, rather than doing what I normally do, which is where I eat Hostess cupcakes, eight of them for, for breakfast, instead I'll have, I don't know, like some toast or maybe like a bagel with cream cheese, which is what I have every breakfast, you know? Maybe instead of starting by getting a bunch of raw chicken breasts that you're going to grill yourself, which, by the way, grilling chicken breasts isn't hard, but if you don't know what you're doing, it can be. Butterflying a chicken breast, cooking it for the right length of time, appropriately, like, oiling the pan and seasoning and everything, that can be pretty difficult. But, you know, in most grocery stores, you can find pre-cooked uh, chicken that's already shredded or a rotisserie chicken that you can shred yourself. And you can get enough protein to, like, um... You, you can get enough protein for like multiple days of food for very little money 
and very little effort. And you can just heat it up a bit and season it, and like sort of toss it around a little bit. Rotisserie chicken's crazy unhealthy, okay? Okay, rotisserie chicken isn't exactly crazy healthy, but compared to the shit a lot of people eat, it is. <laughs> you know, there are tears here. Um, there are there are tiers of health, and, and rotisserie chicken is far from the lowest tier. Yeah, I'm just saying don't torture yourself by, like, trying to buy the healthy foods, you know. Um, just try to find some basic stuff that you enjoy. Chicken is a good bet. Beans, rice, staple foods like that. Try to get away from large amounts of, like, just carbohydrates, you know. Um, pasta is good, but it's not really great for you. But it's not terrible. It's a good staple food. Um, rice is a little bit better than that. If it's like whole wheat pasta, it can be pretty good. Um, oh, my favorite thing, by the way, potatoes. I know I've made jokes like this before, but oh my god, man. Uh, baked potatoes are just so good. You can literally, like, a full potato, which is really filling, is like 300 calories. And you can just, like, a little bit of butter, some salt, some pepper, um, a little bit of cheese if you like, and then you can add some basic seasoning, like some Greek yogurt and hot sauce mixed together, which I have with almost everything, and is delicious, uh, and very healthy. Oh yeah, some garlic, of course, of course. If you don't mind, can you elaborate with any struggles with anxiety and or, God forbid, insecurity you've had in the past? I always feel like you have it all figured out. I need some bringing back to earth. I'm really, really sorry to say, my anxieties are mostly existential, and I don't really feel insecurity that much. I have always been a stupidly confident person. My growth has been curtailing that to be less insufferable, not developing it. I have been extremely depressive in the past. That was also a struggle, and continues to be. But my issues aren't so much with day-to-day -day anxiety. I do feel tremendous anxiety at times, but they're not usually about things I have any direct control over. In fact, they're often about things I don't, which is, of course, innately irrational, but that's anxiety for you. Um, and insecurity just isn't really my thing. So yeah, potatoes. A San Francisco 49ers hat. Tough 49ers game, huh? Yeah, man. Tough loss, but hey, man, it's all good. We made it to... I felt where we were supposed to be. Can't get punished. Yes, sir. Talk, brother. Do you need to receive? Uh, no, thank you. All right, thanks, my friend. Have a good one. Have a good day. All right, how about that? Made a nice conversation over some football action because he had a 49ers hat on, and that was my last goal for. You do not have to pretend to care about sports. Stay strong. Day. As the days would go on, and I kept asking myself, This also explains why your dating advice is just go talk to people forehead? No. Don't do the incel thing where you get mad at me just because I don't have the exact same problems you do. I have always been fully aware of how difficult conversation can be for other people, and my advice factors that in. Just because I have an easier time with it doesn't mean that you shouldn't have to do it, you know? There are probably things that other people are a lot better at than I am, but that doesn't excuse my insufficiency in regards to that, right? Like, if I couldn't cook at all and other people could cook better than me, like, say, for example, my brother can, and he was like, you need to learn how to cook. I couldn't be like, oh, well, it's so easy for you, because sure, maybe it is, but that doesn't mean the advice is any less warranted. I still should be able to cook. Most of you are fully capable of having a casual conversation with a grocery bagger. I believe in you. It may take a little bit of effort, but take it easy. It's fine. If you make a mistake, if you're a little bit awkward, if you're a little bit, even, God forbid, weird when you talk to them, that's okay. That just happens. I've done that. I'm fully capable of speaking publicly, and I'm fully capable of being charismatic, and all the same, I have had plenty of conversations with random strangers that were just kind of weird or awkward, you know? Literally, just the other day, I was, um, I was boarding a flight from Los Angeles to Seattle to get back to my work after my vacation, and I was wearing uh, basically a romper with short shorts with a five-inch inseam and a t-shirt. It was about 40 degrees in LA that morning and like 25 in Seattle. And when I, um, when I was boarding the plane, the air stewardess looked at me and she was like, uh, a bit cold to be wearing that, huh? And I looked at her uh, at 8 a.m., sleep sand in my eyes, having not showered, having not any intention to talk to people, and I grumbled something that sounded probably something like, uh, you too, Seattle, and like sort of stumbled by her. Um, probably not a highlight conversationally for her, but I'm not beating myself up over it because I was fucking sleepy. The worst thing you can do in situations like that is think like, oh God, she was so cringe at my behavior. No, she wasn't. She's an air hostess. She talks to hundreds of people a day. She doesn't remember me, and that's fine. It doesn't matter. It's all good. Don't be too hard on yourself.
Being hard on yourself does not beget improvement. It inhibits it. What's the next smallest step I can take? I'd finally start to see my first bit of progress. Now for a little while, as I was following this next smallest step routine and I was adopting good habits, getting rid of some bad ones and just slowly working my way towards that new identity, things would go pretty smoothly. But if I'm really trying to come out of dark place, then sometime within the first couple weeks, the dopamine I would get from essentially starting a new life would start to wear off and I'd hit my first roadblock, being too hard on myself. If there's- Okay, okay, okay all right, okay. One thing that will be inevitable when trying to improve yourself and get out of a rut, it's that you will fail, you will mess up sometimes, and you'll have periods of time where you are less motivated and fall off. But from my experience, one of the only things that separates those who actually build the new identity from those who don't is their ability to just keep moving forward you, even up. when they hit the dip. So what is the dip? The dip is the part in your getting out of a rut journey where you start to regress a little bit. You're going to start to notice some of your negative habits come back. Guys, if you're ever eating potato chips off your stomach, you need to stop, okay? This is literally like sitcom 101 depiction of person in a depressive cycle. If you're doing this, like, the, like to, whatever you're doing, it doesn't need to be this. Oh, by the way, learning how to deal with the dip in confidence is the best way to know how to diet properly, okay? Nobody sticks perfectly to a diet. Zero people do that. It's not possible. Eating is like the, en is the fuel of the engine that is your body. It's too important. Nobody is perfect with their diets, you know? Uh, if you if you mess up a little bit, the, the, the critical difference is this, okay? You're doing well with your diets, and then, like, you mess up a little, and you mess up a little, and you mess up a little, and then you realize, like, oh boy, like, I'm kind of regressing. And there are two things you can do at that point. You can take the depressive route, and you can go, oh, of course I'm regressing, I'm a failure, it was never gonna work, and fall off, and you ruin everything. Or you can go, mistakes are human, they happen, let's go. I'll bounce back when I can, and you work to go back up. And the latter response is always the right one. The former is never the right one. Having the tenacity to go, even I can, you know, recover from a mistake, is so critical when it comes to long-term change. So important. Back your confidence that you have slightly built up by making promises to yourself, keeping them and going through with them will start to be harder to do or you might not even do them at all. And this is the pivotal point where you gotta figure out why your self-talk is like this, who instilled that self-talk into you, and how you can start to become more aware of when it happens and how to transform it into something more positive. So here's what I'm gonna do. In a journal, I'm gonna evaluate exactly what is going on in my head when I start to feel myself regressing a little bit. Each negative thought I have about myself or my life, I'm gonna write down in this uh, journal entry titled, The Dip Thoughts. And some of the thoughts that arose- I've heard that writing down depressive thoughts can be very, very helpful uh, for some people. I've never done it, but I've heard it can be helpful, so I'm not going to diss it. Those were, I'll never have the strength to make real progress. I'm just gonna fail like I always do. Most people could easily do what I can barely accomplish. I need to be doing more than what I've been doing, and there's no hope for me. When I wrote these down, I asked myself, where did these come from? Because clearly I can think back to a time in my life when I was a really small kid where I was happy and I felt like I could do anything with my life, but eventually I was conditioned to believe that I'm not gonna amount to many things because I'm not doing a certain sort of lifestyle, or I just was beaten down so much by peers, by family members, and that's what I actually ended up writing down after I answered that question. So all these thoughts I had about not being good enough, about feeling like a failure, it was all conditioned, it was all programmed into me by someone outside of me, and it wasn't really an accurate representation of reality. When instead, I need to transform all of these dip thoughts that I had into something that relates to the growth mindset. This is when I would look up a growth mindset chart on Google Images. After finding a solid one, which I'll be sure to link in the description, I would find the sentence that most resembles each fixed mindset thought I had from my journal and transform it into its growth mindset. Isn't this kind of like a light version of cognitive behavioral therapy? Obviously, it's not the same as the therapy part. Like, it's, uh, it's, you know, but it, like, kind of in line with the concept. Yeah. The counterpart. So I'll never have the strength to make real progress turned into I am still making progress even though my brain has unrealistic expectations for me. If I keep going, I'll only make even more progress than I've already made. I'm just gonna fail like I always do change to if I fail, I know it's just an opportunity for me to get better. And there's no hope for me changes to if I keep going and staying consistent, I will see massive changes in a few months. And every time this happens, because yes, it's gonna happen more than once, you need to stop yourself real quick before you start reacting immediately 
immediately and thinking, my life's over, I'm going back to the person who I was, I'm never gonna meet that identity. You stop, you put your thoughts onto something physical, like a piece of paper, like a journal, and you transform them. And yes, they're gonna- I think that can be good. I've heard that's really good. I, I think cognitive behavioral therapy is basically the first time in a long time that there's been a constructive, like, doctrinal and consistent approach towards um, psychotherapy. Because for a long time, I think, not to say there's been no grounding theory, but I think a lot of therapists kind of fucking wing it, and it's been really to the detriment of therapy, like, as a field. A lot of people make fun of shrinks and therapists, and I don't think it's fully warranted, but historically, mm, I don't want to sound anti-intellectual, but I do feel like the field kind of has a history of just being full of quacks who will just do whatever they think is right, you know? Like, a bunch of therapists will just be, like, wildly unhelpful because they have their own preconceptions on how to behave. And that's the reason why we have medical standards, right? Like, you wouldn't want every surgeon to have their own idea on how to do surgery. That'd be fucking wild. So, likewise, you don't want every therapist to have their own idea on how to do therapy. You want, like, a standard model that the therapist is trained to adapt to the individual patient. That's how you want for all doctors, right? Like, that's the whole point of standards. And I think cognitive behavioral therapy is the first time that we've had, like, a reliable model for 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 therapy for a lot of situations um and that's good keep coming up throughout this journey it's inevitable i still have negative thoughts the actual coal not the down bad coal still has negative thoughts but i just know how to properly handle them and not let hold on cbt exists as a capitalist way of providing therapy it puts the effort on the individual to change and the results are expected and not inspired in the case of a person centered models well Yes, in therapy, the onus would be on the individual to change. I don't think you can put society on, uh, to therapy. The, the point is for the individual to change, I think. It's kind of the goal. Let them overtake me to the point where I just stop wanting to put in the work. And every day you come back here to these two pieces of paper that you put up on your wall. Constantly remind yourself of why you're doing this, the identity you're trying to become. And eventually you'll get out of that rut that you have found. Okay, yourself. I think we, okay. I think we got the point of the video. This is just the wrap up at the end. This wasn't as bad as I thought. Um, it's kind, it's kind of, um... It's kind of negatively influenced by the fact that the guy, apparently this guy is like reactionary stuff broadly. I mean, I haven't watched these videos, but I'd be pretty surprised if I couldn't find things to criticize here. Why you should be a loser. True. Watch the NPC video. Um, do we watch, do we want to watch another one? Can it, okay, make it a second segment. I, that one was long enough. Um. No, no, cut the segment. No, 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 stop, 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 stop. No, stop. No, okay, don't make it a separate segment. We're just gonna look at one second of it, okay? I know I've said that before, but this time it's for real. Okay, hold on. Where is it? Okay, just a second. What is happening to critical thinking? And why does it feel like, in a time where we can more readily access the truth, we've only become far more divided? December 25th, 2003. It was the norm. And what happens when every echo chamber you can think of exists? Well, it means it's much easier to back. Now, let me ask you a question. What's the easiest way to convince someone you are right and worth following? Well, in my experience, you just need to give them no space to question your stance, speak with confidence and conviction, and title everything and say everything with those superlatives that we talked about earlier. This type of devotion to one person isn't new. It's been prominent. This seems mostly like a video on the nature of gurus and stuff and like listening to that wait is it possible that this video is actually a critique of listening to gurus rather than like just an attack on progressive absolutely no meaning and we need leaders because at the very least they give us strength and help to give us some sense of the world oh, but the on. problem arises when you completely lose your ability to see outside of that bubble or leader that has given you that certainty meaning and direction and since almost anyone with an internet connection some confidence and a general understanding of human psychology can amass a following now there are tons of new different bubbles with different gurus that all seem to have the supposed right answer to your problems oh okay all right Maybe the video's okay. All right, I didn't want to watch the full video, but okay. I, I, if anything, I would say it actually feels more like these videos are being thumbed and titled 
in a way that's meant to like bring in younger reactionary people. If that's the case, then I think that's actually pretty smart. Uh, maybe there's some bad stuff here. I don't really know. That's fine. 